Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today. My name is Cody Brewer and I am the Business Development Manager here at Productive Plastics. Today we are happy to be able to put on this informational webinar for you that is focused on replacing metal components with thermoformed plastics. After our presentation, we will have a Q&A session, so please feel free to submit questions in the Q&A window at any time during the webinar and we'll get those answered towards the end. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Evan Gillum for his part of the presentation. Hi, I'm Evan Gillum. Uh, I've been with Productive Plastics for over 18 years. Uh, I'm a sitting member of Society of Plastics Engineers. I've led uh, a couple hundred successful tooling projects in 10 major markets. I've integrated over 20 uh, manufacturing processes with thermoforming at PPI, and I'm looking forward to being the third generation of ownership at Productive Plastics later this year. Uh, hopefully you'll find this uh, webinar informative. Um, I've been uh, at PPI. PPI has been in business since 1955, started originally by my grandfather and then ushered into plastics by my father. It was started originally as a pattern shop in the basement of the original owner, my grandfather's house. Uh, it is managed in five different locations and three different building upgrades through its existence. Uh, it has taken five different core processes in-house and managed 20, more than 20 different services that we've brought to our different customers. Um, throughout the life of Productive Plastics, we serviced over hundreds of customers and provided more than thousands of employees careers. So we're very excited to start to share some of our information with you as a company. And uh, hopefully you find some of our information uh, valuable and we look forward to discussing how to convert some of your plastic sheet metal into plastics thermoforming. So uh, we'd like to start the presentation for you now with our uh, uh, comparison guide. Okay, uh, thank you. We'd like to go over a couple things relative to thermoforming and replacing metal in your products. An important thing here at Productive is making sure that we're discussing with you where thermoforming makes sense relative to your product. Our view is if we don't give you good feedback on your product, then you're less likely to engage us in your next uh, design endeavor, in your next evaluation, and your next project. And we're really looking to build a good relationship. We're really looking to be a trusted advisor to you, uh, not just for the current project, but for all your projects. And for us, in order to position ourselves there, we both have to advise you when thermoforming makes sense. We also have to advise you when your current process of using metal makes the most sense. So we really uh, made this tool for uh, upgrading your plastics uh, thermoforming to replace your metal, it's really meant to show you where metal makes sense and where thermoforming makes sense. And we do believe thermoforming gives you the best performance in the marketplace over metal, but you have to be looking for specific things to upgrade. So hopefully as we go through this design guide, it allows you to see where those things are, what are the things that you can take advantage of with thermoforming, and what are the things that metal mo makes the most sense to stay in that process? So we developed this tool and I wanna take you through it. It's a PDF and as you see, it's the exact same guide that you would download from our website. So you can see here the first page, a comparison and conversion guide, upgrading metal to plastics thermoforming. As we go down here, the first page is explaining the overview of what's in this report and what you can expect to see at the different sections. Also here, it discusses why the report exists, what you're trying to get through, what you can expect to uh, get through this report and what we're trying to accomplish. In the overview, we discuss our understanding of the sheet metal fabrication process. There's definitely additional steps. There's definitely additional pieces of information, but we're trying to give you an overview of the process so that we can relatively explain 
the process of metal, the process of sheet metal, and then compare that to the thermoforming process in a relatively straightforward manner as far as what are the positives, what are the advantages, and then how do these really stack up, and when does one make sense versus another? And really the key points here that I take away as we compete against this process is, you know, as your geometry gets more and more complex, as the finishes that you're looking for get more and more complex, that's really where thermoforming starts to make sense. Because in sheet metal, in metal processing as a whole, the more steps you add, the more finishes you add, the more complexity that you're looking for, either currently or possibly in the future in your design, that's really where thermoforming starts to make sense because in the plastics processing, you can add a lot of that stuff using the current process or a very minimal investment in your tooling because that tool uh, can incorporate a lot of that 3D geometry very easily. So single directional bends, uh, single directional movements, very easy for metal to accommodate, but as soon as you want to do some three-dimensional bends or have uh, some uh, reoccurring dimensional items across different parts, that's really where thermoforming starts really making sense for you. Uh, obviously, as you go through, there's certain things inherently uh, advantage uh, in plastics uh, relative to rust and oxidation that you can take advantage of with plastics as a whole. So we're going to get into some additional uh, items here. This is talking about plastics thermoforming, heavy gauge forming as a whole, discussing the differences. It also starts talking about uh, the differences between pressure forming and vacuum forming. It starts giving you an idea here. You can see a tool, you know, you can kind of start seeing if you're not familiar with thermoforming that you're not having to process separately all these features and bolt them into a main assembly. You have relatively fast forming times. Uh, once your investment in the tool is made, it's all being processed relatively at the same time. And although you do have different process steps, basically the part is going through those steps almost no matter what uh, the design of the part is or uh, depending on your final design, it's relatively similar steps regardless of the part. So uh, a lot of the things you're putting here as far as when forming makes sense, what kind of wide range you have, and again, over the life cycle of your product, you've got a lot of flexibility in your design, and it gives you a lot of flexibility over multi-piece assemblies to cost-effectively accomplish your design goals. Uh, some quick reference kind of shows the process that we'll get some additional information on as we go into the case study. And you can see the difference of kind of a vacuum forming, taking a flat sheet, pulling it against the mold, and then separating the part from the formed sheet, and pressure forming showing the forming process, pressing the, uh, the sheet against the tool into tight corners and into texture, which is really what separates the pressure forming that gives you that injection molded type look on a large part. Uh, a big consideration for thermoforming is weight considerations against metals. Uh, heavy weight is a big consideration during design, specifically in transportation markets. And we've done a lot of market research that really covers Thermoforming specifically uh, covers a need where fuel consumption is a big concern, and you can see that in specific gravity. It's a big advantage for plastics as you're uh, looking to take advantage of the specific gravity against your metals. It's just something that you have to pay attention to and something that uh, is a big reason to move towards thermoplastics against uh, you know, even aluminum, which would be considered on the lighter end for some of your metal panels. Another consideration as you look to compare metals to plastics would be your lead times. Uh, metals, depending on the design, can be delivered very quickly, but also as your design complexities start to uh, come into a more aesthetically pleasing part or a more complex part, uh, it starts getting into more and more process steps uh, where thermoforming, as you get into its process steps, it's basically more or less the same couple of steps, you know, depending if you're getting your parts painted or not, or if you're molding in your texture or finish. 
Again, uh, it's about the same couple of steps. It could vary slightly between your design and what you're trying to accomplish, but by and large, you're keeping it the same steps where you know, metal gets more and more complex as you get more and more complex processes. The design capabilities and effect on cost, we try to give you an idea on what that type of stuff looks like. And again, consider your design phase at the beginning of your product, as well as what types of things could you be looking at decoratively, design changes, what things might you be having in your uh, products in the future, how might that impact what you might be doing in the future. So as your complexity increases, your part cost also will increase a metal where thermoforming tends to stay relatively flat. And as a plastics process, there's a lot you can do there with thermoforming. Strength to weight ratio is another big consideration. Uh, plastics is something to be considered as you go against metal. So metal has a very high strength to weight ratio, uh, which is good. That's why it's used for a lot of structural parts like cars and things like that for its superstructure. But in a lot of cases for some of the panels it's used, it doesn't require as much strength to weight ratio. So plastics has good strength to weight ratio against a lot of a number of other materials. The question is, what is the environment your particular product is going through? Do you need to stand up to luggage making impact on your product versus a car crash or uh, you know a, uh, a a larger impact structure? And you know, do you want it to bend and not break, or uh, does it have to uphold the certain chemical structures or cleaning? Uh, it's all in understanding the environment of your product, not necessarily uh, over engineering your product. Next to consider is uh, strength to stiffness. You know, what does your product need to do in the environment it's in? And tries to give you some things to consider. You can see you get a wide range with different plastics uh, processes and uh, the different uh, ways in which plastic is processed against its steel counterparts. You know, what kind of things are you considering as you're looking at uh, the metal counterparts and then what process are the metals processed against and then what process are the plastics thermoforming using to compare against? You know, uh, what is required in your environment? Are you over uh, engineering or over requiring what's needed in your environment? Are there adjacent uh, markets that we could compare against to see if your process could stand up uh, and take advantage of certain thermoforming and or plastics environments. And then we've got in here the design guide, a good side-by-side -side comparison to try and summarize how do you consider thermoforming against metal. And what I tell customers in this section is try to compare uh, relative values. When you look at some of these pieces, it's hard to say, will this product stand up to a 50 pound impact? Well, that's a little bit harder to say because the geometry of your part will dictate that, your environment will dictate that, temperature will sometimes dictate that. A lot of things come into play with that uh, where I think you can say comparatively metal to plastic will perform in this manner. Uh, and we'll get into some of the things of what makes a product and a project successful in some of the next pages coming down. But this is a good way to start comparing and just making sure what are the things I need to talk to about my processor? What are the things that I need to bring in my discussion with the resin supplier and my material supplier? So next we want to talk about what are the things we want to consider as I make my decision of who my processor is and what are the other parts of my project I need to consider. So one of the first things up is who is the right processor for me to work with, right? So who's going to help me to decide what are the right things to decide what is the right process for me and who is the right processor for me to work with? What is the criteria I would decide of who is that trusted advisor that's going to help me work through my project and protect my product. Second would be adapting your existing product design to plastics thermoforming process. This is really critical to make sure that I take advantage of all the items that plastics has 
over metal and then I'm fully realizing all the advantages of plastics over metal and not exposing myself to some of the pitfalls that I might uh, that I might not be seeing as I'm going through that transition, making sure that I'm mitigating my risks, making sure that I'm seeing the items and asking the right questions as I go through that process and uh, that I'm making sure I'm testing all my uh, products going through those steps, right? So am I considering, could I be using the same tool with different trim variants? Am I using family tools to reduce my tooling costs? Uh, am I considering where uh, my metal is aiding my design and how do I mitigate that risk with my plastics? As I go to my material selection, uh, ultimately, as the OEM, the designer, I have to make that selection, but am I, am I being asked questions to consider as I look at both the performance of my material and how does that impact my build plan, my assembly, uh, what kind of processes I'm choosing there? What kind of tooling? The investment in tooling is critical because it is 100% the asset of the person purchasing the tooling. And is it transferable? Uh, will uh, a possible another processor be able to use it? Will the uh, life cycle of my product match the investment of tooling that I'm making? Will I have to refurbish my tooling if I choose low cost tooling? Uh, will my tooling uh, continue to produce and repeat the product that I need? Are my uh, tolerances realistic for the tooling I selected? All that uh, should be discussed with your processor to make sure that all those things are matching up. And then finally, the prototype testing phase is one of the hardest things to make sure that both sides are discussing because it's the thing that people want to skip. It's costly. It's something that people have to make sure they discuss because it's critical in making sure that both sides are uh, mitigating their risk through the prototyping process. And really, when you start talking about performance and testing and making sure that your product is going to be successful in the marketplace, the prototype testing is really the only place that you can ensure that. So it's got to be a discussion that you have with your suppliers, making sure that you're engaging them, making sure that you're both talking about how to work together to accomplish some of these items. It can really help you make sure that you've got good investment and that you're, you're, you're working to uh, overcome your obstacles through the prototyping phase. And then finally, uh, how can we get started, right? How do we engage each other as early as possible through your quoting phase, try to work out some sort of selection criteria that we can both feel comfortable with, and then move forward? Because the earlier we can engage each other and start working, the earlier we can start working together towards your goals, both commercially and uh, engineering-wise, to make a successful project. I'd like to take you through uh, a real world example that I think exhibits a number of the things that made a, a real world project successful in a case study. I'd like to start taking you through uh, a uh, metal conversion that we did for a telecom box. I think it's a good example because it displays a lot of complex thermoforming as well as a lot of items that kind of showcase what would be a very difficult uh, design in uh, metal and shows how thermoform was able to overcome them as well as a good relationship between a plastics processor and a uh, very uh, capable metal supplier trying to understand how to do plastics thermoforming. So you can see here a product that's showing in uh, New York City. It's a uh, complex electronics inside, but uh, relatively uh, easy to understand and straightforward design of a box two-part uh, exterior part. So the overview of the project is the customer is looking to get a old style uh, call box design. Uh, the end customer, uh, if you will, between the designer and the builder was looking for a very specific look of an old call box uh, that were uh, previously cast. So the customer had made uh, three prototypes out of sheet metal and they were, as I said before, cast designs which allowed for certain things to happen 
Uh, but you know, where that was a very reasonable design in the turn of the century today, uh, just not really something that they were looking to do for numerous reasons, weight, uh, ease of use, um, life of the product, where it needed to go, uh, a number of reasons they were looking to change how that product was going to be rolled out. So the prototypes were made out of sheet metal and incorporated uh, rounded edges and a single undercut with no transition. So I'm going to go back one quick slide just to kind of show uh, they incorporated an edge kind of circled there and the uh, they were showing kind of a single level similar to what this is showing here. Uh, they uh, showed us some of the designs in person. I don't actually have any digital pictures of it. So it kind of just gives you an idea of they had to do a lot of cutting, welding, and sanding to achieve what would be shown as kind of a 3D edge here. And uh, they could not display kind of a rounded edge there shown like that. So they had to do a lot of sanding, welding, cutting uh, type of stuff to achieve that. And, you know, as you can imagine, a lot of uh, hand done uh, activities uh, were raising the price 1,200 to 2,000 units per, and that was not even achieving that raised hole feature that we'll get down into later. So uh, not only was this a concern for them, uh, as the customer is looking to batch install of 100 to 200 units at a time, so they were looking to send out trucks install multiple streets at a time, take the units online. They weren't looking to do one or two units a day. They were looking to do uh, almost blocks and cities at a time. And at a uh, production of five units a week at the current process, it was really a problem for them where thermoforming could accomplish, you know, 50 units per shift uh, on two machines. That was uh, much more achievable for how they were trying to do their rollout of multiple units and crews and things like that. So uh, the design requirements, they were looking for rounded edges. You can see kind of a zoomed in version in CAD and they were looking for raised features. You can see that repeating feature here of kind of a scalloped edge. And again, with casting, that was very feasible at turn of the century. They could make it very thick, very heavy. Uh, they would pour the, you know, the molten lead in there and no problem, but in today's technology, uh, very problematic. Uh, and they just didn't want to deal with some of those issues and concerns that you had with, um, with, uh, with some of those problems. With the uh, additional design requirements, they had a, uh, a designed in gap and a split level uh, gapping undercut between the two pieces. Uh, it's a nice looking transaction, but represented a number of design concerns from their sheet metal understanding. Uh, the customer is looking for a two piece latch. We're going to get into that because the latch that they had designed was extremely costly, extremely complex, uh, very custom and just had a lot of machine parts, all just leading to a very uh, commercially non viable solution. Uh, the lid that they had uh, it was just uh, overly designed in terms of it was very heavy. Uh, you could probably, the, the plastic parts and the sheet metal parts probably would rip apart before this piece uh, would even uh, be bent. You could see here again, it was uh, very elaborate, very strong, very sturdy, but again, it was, you know, uh, getting close to uh, even at high volumes of purchase, 60 to $90 for the full assembly. And that was just for the attaching components, not for the frame piece you can see here that is kind of circled in red going all the way around the base. So what we did is we worked with them to come up with a simple tongue and groove type solution with a sheet metal catch on one side, uh, a latching mechanism that uh, simplified using some CNC uh, catch areas and a very simple blind rivet system. And the solution uh, came in at you know under $20 and uh, we could uh, incorporate it at much lower ranges in terms of how many we had to buy at one time. Uh, 
the customer was looking for a material that would be UV stable outdoors and it had to not interfere with the electronic signal coming through. Uh, also, as we are going through the selection, uh, the transmission had to be tested and we needed a resin that would uh, remain dimensionally stable throughout the life of the product, but also through the build process. So you can see here, we had to do some testing for the transmission of the signal. It was a specific signal that was going through that they had to have uh, a low percentage of loss, as well as uh, you can see here on the right, we had to do a number of testing to make sure that the transition point uh, specifically created some loss of how the geometry shrank back and adjusted for this part. So uh, it represented some challenges that were unforeseen as we were going through the design process. And we'll talk a little bit about how we mitigated that and kind of worked through that. Some solutions were uh, highly engineered. Some kind of got a little bit more practical, if you will. I'd like to play a quick clip uh, showing the thermoforming process. Uh, this is going to show the tooling that we used, showing some of the undercuts and kind of the, the complexity of accomplishing what we did for this product. This is showing the deeper uh, base. What you're seeing is the loose pieces for this tool that are air activated here that you're seeing from the mouse. And then uh, you're seeing the part here but you can see the undercuts that are formed in from the flat piece going through the aluminum tool is in the top and that allowed us uh, for the pusher to uh, drive the material up to get a more uniform distribution of material. Okay, so the next slide will show this same tool. And again, just a further back view to showcase the loose pieces, the undercut showing an uneven uh, achieved direction, how many different pieces had to come together. scallop pieces as you come in those features that we went through trying to form and then you can see here a CNC cut uh, cutting the scallop pieces from another direction just kind of gives you a close-up of what we did to finish cut that part so here kind of talks about the challenges of the process uh, you can see here we were gridding out sheets to see where our material was distributing and to kind of give you some idea of what a good processor will do as well as what the process will do uh, trying to distribute material. So uh, the tooling will move the materials to where it needs to be uh, part of the main drawdown area circle below. So we will try to move material down into where the part is as opposed to leaving it on the surface of the tool. So the pusher in the right hand picture is pushing material down into that area. So to give you an idea of the difference in processor is we, uh, the drawdown ratio into that area reduces the starting thickness 42%. So you're going from a starting thickness, and we'll get into some math that I'll show later, with a pusher. Uh, so we're getting around 51% uh, by weight. So your, uh, the drawdown is 42%. You're getting 51% of the weight pushed into that area. So we'll get into the math of that a little bit later, and I think it'll be a little bit more clear. Uh, the tooling is moving the material into the undercut. So we're trying to capture the material into the undercut as we're stretching, trying to push as much material as possible because it's going to not want to move into that undercut area. Again, the uh, complexity of the tooling and the sophistication of the processor is trying to not create a thin area for you where injection molding can design pressing that material in the area. We have to design 
pushing and pulling and specifically moving the area into that material into that area. So uh, same thing with the scallop area, we're using tooling and process to move material into the raised areas with the 21 features circled below. The draw ratio for that area, the starting thickness would typically move it down into 15% with the very edge coming down to a 8 thousandths or 15 thousandths thick. So if we did nothing special, we would uh, end up with a 8 to 15 thousandths thick area in the very tip. That would obviously uh, represent a lot of issues for that customer in terms of thickness. Uh, we were able to push uh, material into that area of 23 to 28, which would not seem significant, but that's 120 to a 200 percent material savings in that area. And I'll talk a little bit about this drawdown because this is uh, the same ratio and idea uh, that can actually, I think, save a lot of money plus lead to a lot of material savings. And it's this thought and concept that I think we can kind of talk commercially a little bit later. But let me let me just kind of get this concept into your mind here. Uh, and we're going to talk uh, kind of mechanically here. This gives you an idea of what we're actually doing to get into this area. So as you talk about spending money on tooling, and again, as the customer OEM or the person purchasing the tool, this is your asset, right? So uh, productive is helping to design it. But when you're spending the money, this is your asset for your product. So the complexity here is it's your investment in making sure this product is consistent. So this is the design we actually use to air activate into this product and drive material into this area to achieve that 120 to 200% increase in thickness. So we used a specific material with a low thermal transfer, and that's what gave us so much uh, additional performance in that area. And really, uh, it sounds like it's a direct performance, but really it's a mitigation of risk. We got a percentage better to get a consistent performance in this product. And you can see here, I kind of outlined the pusher area, it's just a little tough to see with the CAD colorization, but uh, an air activated piece was pushing an entire loose piece out here. And what's lost kind of is in this picture is not only is an air activated piece pushing it, but you also had water cooling going into this area in order to manage this raised hole feature. So not only was it extending in to push the material, as it was demolding, this area was retracting and a water cooled area was uh, operating in this uh, complex part of the tool. So as a commercial concern in a drawdown area, what I tried to do is kind of show from a commercial concern, and I'm gonna talk about this of saving money, uh, but I'm gonna to touch on this just before the end of the concept, because what you wanna understand is how this might impact you commercially. So uh, why does the draw ratio matter in thermoforming? So if we take this base part, if the material drawdown is drawn down to 42% of the starting thickness, and that's taking the surface area against the surface area of the sheet. If the sheet thickness is 350 or approximately nine millimeters, uh, a 42% drawdown is a 0.147 average. This will vary across the different geometry. Now a drawdown into the 21 uh, raised hole feature on a 0.147 average drawdown brings you to a 15% drawdown a, or a 0.2205 average thickness. This still will vary, especially into the tip of those features, the, the, the furthest point away from that, uh, from that flat. So if you want to increase the average by 30%, you have to increase the starting thickness by 30%. So you have to average the entire sheet cost or the entire raw material. That'll increase the total pounds the entire total pounds or the purchase by 6.3 pounds. So you raise the entire piece cost by $20. Or 
you could uh, take the techniques that we took that increased uh, the tool uh, cost and uh, the thickness is increased almost by double and your investment into some of those mechanical pieces and things like that was less than a thousand dollars in tooling but it, it reduces a, a material cost of almost $20 per unit. So you can see that you know, some of these uh, expertise costs and programming costs and material costs, uh, you know, using the right supplier can help save you a, a lot of per unit costs. It can save you a lot of headache and save you a lot of design cost. And that's what you have to consider as you're choosing the right partners. What is the offset? What is that sunk cost of, of not having the right partner, the right relationship, the right discussions, the right design uh, process. Uh, consequently, as you're starting to talk to um, somebody about stiffening apart, about uh, making the mechanical structure correct, um, as you are looking at thickening apart in metals and increasing the thickness in metals, uh, you do have a certain amount of stiffness that you can get in metal, but in plastics, if you raise the mechanical properties, as you add geometry to it in thermoforming, the cost to add geometry in tooling or a um, recycled barrier or a uh, additional laminate layer, sometimes you can do that for a much lower cost than what you would in adding uh, a piece of metal or adding uh, an injection molding um, layer. So I think that's really what I want to hit home is there's a lot of design options that you can use in thermoforming that we want to talk to you as a supplier. So uh, we start talking about process challenges. So this is a good example where we kind of talk, uh, you know, kind of push out the engineering, push out the uh, elegant solutions and, and this is where productive as a supplier kind of got a little bit more um, uh, down and dirty and just had to come up with solution for a supplier. So uh, we, we came up with a jig. This really just came down to a shrink rate that we just couldn't get coming back. The material, uh, because of its geometry, wanted to pull back in one specific area. Uh, the cooling fixture uh, was not doing what it traditionally was doing. We were bringing in consultants. Uh, it was a heavy shrink area because of how much geometry was loading in the area. Um, we, we quickly fabricated a fixture. We quickly tested out a design. Uh, a design for experiment and once we put this fixture in place and a process in place we documented it we trained our suppliers and uh, even though this didn't uh, look very fancy it gave repeatability for over 3500 units without a fit issue uh, per year for two years so uh, we were able to quickly understand the issue uh, another example of this was we had a screen that the customer let us know to keep vermin out. Um, they needed to put the screen on. Uh, they had chosen a low surface energy like TPO. We involved the resin and extruder. Uh, we got together, we met on how to uh, overcome the low surface energy issue. We involved uh, 3M and a number of other uh, suppliers. We were able to understand what we were trying to do with the low surface energy material. We came up with a, uh, again, solution that um, wasn't extremely high tech, overcame the problem, added a couple of little pieces just to make sure that it didn't kind of pin up. And although it didn't uh, heavily, uh, didn't use rocket science to overcome, we kind of just got a little unique, a little, uh, a little down and dirty, rolled up our sleeves and got a solution that worked for the customer. So uh, thermoform was ultimately the right process for this customer because it was a cost efficient model and it met their build plan. It met uh, their mitigation of the risk and it was just the right fit for what they were trying to do. Uh, the dimensional contours, uh, the little impact to the piece price and the tooling costs all just met the niche that they were trying to get into. The environmental pieces fit, the radio transmission, and it fit the build plan for the crews 
and it was far superior to what metal did for this particular process and the amount of skilled labor and scale up that they needed. So that's really uh, why thermoforming met and then this is really why you know productive was a good solution because uh, we were able to aid them and add value to their process and become kind of a trusted advisor to them and really we fit that that skill of how design was dictating a lot of their costs so that's why we felt we were a good fit for them we became uh, a trusted advisor and we feel that we added a lot of value for them as a supplier not just as a process so uh, that's really where we think we fit in their particular niche for this program all right evan thank you so much for bringing us through all that appreciate it and for everyone else thank you for sticking with us through our little audio issues at the beginning um, this is the first webinar we are doing in our webinar series so as you can see we had a little bit of growing pains but appreciate everyone sticking sticking with us through it um, so now um, one of the things we'd like to do is go on to the Q&A session. So again, we have a couple of questions that were submitted and at any time you can continue to submit more. Um, we'll go through this for a few minutes as time allows, but we want to make sure we're conscious of everyone's time and, and get out of here in a timely manner. Um, so Evan, I have someone asking, um, what are typical tooling costs associated with thermal forming versus a sheet metal formed pro uh, project? Uh, so uh, that's a good question. Um, I, as always, it's it's a little tough uh, to answer a question of what typical costs are for tooling. Uh, you know, a lot of things can play into what tooling costs. Uh, we typically start with the conversation with people. You know, five thousand, fifteen thousand dollars for aluminum tooling. A lot of that can play into. Are you looking at uh, soft tooling, which can be in the thousand dollar dollars range? Uh, 3D printed tooling, how big your part has a lot to do with it. But we we try to kind of encourage people that you know uh, you can definitely do wood tooling or uh, cast poured tooling. Uh, you know you can do very cost effective tooling for thermoforming. But ultimately, uh, if you're looking for high end uh, thermoform parts for the types of markets that are typically looking for aesthetic parts. Um, you're usually looking for uh, an aluminum tool temperature controlled. You're usually looking in the uh, tens of thousands of dollars. But if you're looking for some prototype tooling, you can get closer to the thousands. But uh, like I said in the presentation, uh, it, it's all about the asset that you're getting. So uh, in, in some ways you want that tooling to be on the higher end because you want that tooling to be uh, dictating the value of your part and how that part looks. So uh, I, I, uh, I don't know if I completely answered the question, but um, you, you want that high end tooling. You want it to be in that, that tens of thousands of dollar range for your product. And if you're starting to get loose pieces with undercuts, uh like that video that you saw in that picture you're you're looking in the the uh 40 50 60 thousand dollar range all right thanks um another question how can we maintain low gloss when vacuum forming tpo how can you maintain low gloss when vacuum forming tpo so uh when you're vacuum forming tpo with low gloss so setting gloss uh, has a lot to do with the texture you choose for the sheet. Uh, it also has to do with the heat that you choose for your material. Uh, it also has to do with how much you were stretching your material. So um, I would say that as you engage your processor, letting them know what type of gloss you're trying to achieve is critical. But uh, if you're really trying to control your gloss, uh, pressure forming, is usually the method that people use for controlling texture. So uh, I would suggest that if you are really trying to control your texture across, uh, especially if it's a number of parts or you're trying to control your gloss relative to another process, I would say typically either pressure forming, uh, TPO is a low surface temperature material, I'm sorry, a low surface 
uh, material. So, uh, you know, trying to paint it or something like that is a challenge. But usually when you're trying to get a consistent gloss, uh, getting the texture consistent through pressure forming is uh, always a, a preferred method uh, from my experience. All right, speaking of texture, we had another question come in. Could you take a minute to explain the difference between using a textured sheet or having a textured mold? Mm. So uh, using a textured mold is most effective when using pressure forming. So uh, pressure forming, some people kind of confuse that pressure forming is pressing the sheet a great distance onto the mold, but pressure forming is really just pressing that sheet almost, uh, you know, a, a thousandth or two, the last uh, little bit just to force it down into that tool, and you're getting a consistent gloss and texture across that sheet, across that part, all the way across the mold, and because you're getting your mold textured, you get a very consistent gloss and you get a very large amount of options for your texture. Uh, and you can also match many parts across a project. So if you've got nine parts coming together, it gives you a lot of options to get a very consistent texture across your parts by texturing your tool. If you are going to texture your sheet, uh, you're getting that sheet textured coming from your sheet supplier. So you're you're somewhat limited to what your sheet supplier uh, has available. Uh, you're also now uh, having your vacuum former supplier. He's going to heat that sheet and you can get some of that texture washing out. So if you're stretching that sheet drastically, you're going to get some of that texture washing out. If you are um, even locally stretching that sheet, you could be getting variation in the texture washout from one area of the sheet to the other. If you're having to heat that sheet a lot, you could be washing out some of the texture, uh, as well as um, some of your more uh, rubbery materials like your olefins, your TPOs, your HDPEs, uh, they'll typically not retain texture as well as some of your uh, crystalline materials like your ABSs, your PVC acrylics, or your PVCs. So uh, yeah, engaging a uh, processor to help with texture is critical. And uh, what we've seen is a lot of people are very um, concerned with texture as they're talking about gloss. Texture really does help to keep gloss consistent and gloss a lot of people will confuse with color. Uh, you can get your color very consistent and very your color will look the same, but uh, gloss will make parts look different from part to part but it's it's really your your uh, it looks like color when you look the parts side by side but it's really your gloss that you're chasing and uh the combination of your texture and and what you're doing with your gloss to control those things is really what you're after all right um we have time for a couple more quick questions uh one being what do you find as you know potential pushbacks that we get from uh, customers looking to change from plat from metals to plastics. Um, you know, what's the what's the most common pushback uh, where a customer might say, I, I, I don't know if I can change from metal to a plastic. Um, one of the, the the hardest ones initially is a lot of people will come to us. Uh, we had a, a a fabricator that does in house metal that gave us a part and they turned to us and said, uh, hey, um, can you do this part cheaper in plastics than I can do it in metal? And, you know, my, my initial response right away was, was probably not. Uh, and here's why, um, your part is designed for metal. It's all single directional bends. It's already the most cost-effective way for metal possible. Uh, but as soon as you want to do a designed in feature or you want that part to look more realistic or you want uh, you know some sort of uh, feature going across the part from one side to the other or you want a logo going across that part uh, that's where thermoforming will look much more effective and uh, it happened to be a uh, gas station design 
on the column of the side of the gas stations and they started getting more exotic on those sides and a lot of them looks like they started going to uh thermoforming or some variation of um of uh it looks like some of them are uh some variation of plastics and i think that's a lot of it is you want to try to take advantage of what thermoplastics thermoforming can do for you uh, by just taking the current design and saying make this cheaper uh, if it's already designed for the most cost effective for that particular process there's kind of no reason to convert it uh, so you want to make sure you're identifying what are you trying to accomplish with that design change or else there's not a reason for you to redesign if that makes sense uh, and then really the the other uh, side that we find is how do I understand uh, how my part is going to perform relative to its current state? So uh, if I have a metal part today and uh, it performs in a certain manner physically, how would my plastic part perform? And, um, you know, I'd say that uh, we've been able to overcome that with people by you know, giving them similar size parts, uh, working with an extruder to try to create some samples, uh, create some um, different looks or colors, trying to get things color matched. It's really just sharing with a processor uh, in honesty, what are the roadblocks that you're seeing that's stopping you from moving? So uh, by being able to share that information, uh, you know, you never know what the processor or what the extruder or what the resin supplier might be able to come up with you and share with you that might be able to give you a comfort level of uh, how to convert. So I, I'd say the second piece is, you know, have an openness to share with those suppliers. What are the things that are actually holding you up? What's the root cause that gives you concern uh, of, of being open to a conversion? All right, thank you, Evan. And that is going to be all the time we have for the Q&A section. Um, so really, I just want to uh, thank everyone for being here with us today. Um, Evan, if you could just advance to the next slide. Um, so again, I hope this was informative for everyone. Again, this is our first in a series of webinars that we'll be doing, uh, other webinars that we have planned. Uh, we'll look at some other conversions such as injection molding or changing fiberglass uh, layout parts to uh, to custom thermal formed parts. Um, and obviously, if you have any thoughts on webinars you might like to see in the future that we didn't list, you know, please send those ideas to us as well. Um, I want to let everyone know that within the next 24 hours, we will be sending out links to the design guide that you saw in this webinar, plus some of the other design guides that we have. I know that was some of the something that people were asking for. Um, and if you can, we'll also be sending out a survey just to kind of check how we did um, audio issues aside, but we know that was an issue. Um, you know, we'd like if anyone's going to be in the Northeast um, in June. Will we, we will be exhibiting at the Design to Part show uh, hosted at the Mohegan Sun in Connecticut. That will be June 23rd and 24th. We'd love to see you there if you want to come by and see us. Um, and as always, if you have any questions or would like to discuss any projects or look for any quotes, my contact information is on the screen right now. Again, I'm Cody Brewer, the business development manager here for Productive Plastics. And once again, I want to thank Evan Gillum for uh, hosting this webinar and walking us through the very informative uh, topic of changing over from sheet metal parts to thermoform plastics. Thank you everyone for uh, attending today. We hope to see you on our future webinars. Have a good afternoon.